I trust that I hardly need to explain what's behind this provocative question. Can Christianity survive in the Middle East? Martin Eckhart of Beirut wrote last month of the growing fear of Islam and Muslims that the present Syrian conflict has been provoking among Christians. Some outside observers are very pessimistic about the survival of Christianity. While I do not share their pessimism, I believe that we need to be utterly realistic about the big picture of what has been happening in recent years and the last 2,000 years. How are we to explain the decrease in the number of Christians and what do we need to do to ensure that we survive? I begin with a simple story to underline the importance of asking the right questions. Max Warren, who was for many years the leader of the Church Mission Society in the UK, used to tell of an experience he had when he was seriously ill in hospital with a mysterious disease after returning from Africa in the 1940s. One day a medical student had to examine him in front of his professor. At the end of the examination, he told the professor his diagnosis of the illness. Warren was convinced that the student would fail because his diagnosis was wrong. Some days later, he saw the professor when he was doing his rounds in the hospital and said to him, I suppose that student failed. No, was the answer. He got the diagnosis wrong, but he would have got there in the end because he asked all the right questions. Here then are the 10 most basic questions which I believe we need to ask. Number one, what does the Quran say about Christians and Christianity? There's a range of responses reflected in verses coming from different periods in Muhammad's life, some quite positive and some more confrontational. One, for example, says that Christians and Jews who believe in God and lead good lives have nothing to be afraid of on the Day of Judgment. Another is very critical of Jews, but more positive about Christians. You shall find the most hostile to the believers to be the Jews and the polytheists, and you will find the closest in affection, aqrabahum muwaddaten is the Arabic, to the believers, those who say we are Christians. Christians are strongly condemned for making exaggerated claims for Jesus, and their claim that God is Christ is described as blasphemy. Laqad kafir. Another verse says that those who disbelieve among the people of the book will have the fire of hell therein to remain. Perhaps the strongest verse is known as the sword verse. Fight, that is, qatilu. Fight those of the people of the book who do not believe in God nor in the last day, who do not forbid what God and his messenger have forbidden, until they pay the tax, the jizya, and agree to submit. Wuhum sahirun. Question number two. What does the Hadith literature say about Christians and Christianity? Here are just a few of the recorded sayings of the Prophet or his companions concerning Christians. The food of those who receive the scripture is lawful for you, and your food is lawful to them. We do not enter your churches because of the statues and pictures. Do not greet the Jews and the Christians before they greet you. And when you meet any of them on the road, force them to go to the narrowest part of it. Any from this community of Jews and Christians who hear of me and die without believing in my message will be among the people of hell. If I live, God willing, I will expel the Jews and Christians from the Arabian Peninsula and I shall leave only Muslims in it. Question three. How do Muslims today interpret the Quran and the Hadith? There are three main principles of interpretation. The first says that the context in the life of the Prophet determines the interpretation, as Bab al 
So, for example, the sword verse has to be interpreted in the light of the very specific situation facing the prophet at a particular time. The second is that a verse which is known to have been revealed later may abrogate the teaching of an earlier verse, Nasr. So some Muslims, and most jihadis today, would argue that the sword verse abrogates earlier verses which were much more affirmative towards Christians. A third principle is that instead of looking for individual proof texts, we need to understand the message of the Quran as a whole. So, while many mainstream Muslims would emphasize the importance of the original context, some Islamists would use the principle of abrogation, arguing that the later commands represent binding principles to be practiced by Muslims today. Many of them have little time for the writings of the Quranic and legal scholars of the Middle Ages and believe that we can go straight back to the Quran to work out their own very literal interpretations. Hadith has almost as much authority for some Muslims as the Quran, and individual sayings are interpreted very literally, while other Muslims reserve the right to make their own judgments about a particular saying. Generally speaking, it seems that the more conservative and literalist Muslims are, the more authority they attach to a particular hadith. Conversely, the more open Muslims are to newer ways of interpreting hadith, the more critical and selective they are likely to be. Question four. What was the status of Christians living under Islam from the seventh century onwards? We've all heard about Christians and Jews living as dhimmis, protected communities under Muslim rule. And we know about the tax that they had to pay, the jizya, as an expression of their submission. The vast majority of the population over whom Muslims ruled were Christians and Jews. So in the first few centuries, a few thousand Arab Muslims were ruling a population that was largely Christian. A code attributed to the Caliph Umar lists a number of restrictions imposed on the Christians regarding dress, the building of churches and houses, and the public display of religion. By the standards of today, the Dhimma system sounds totally unacceptable because it makes Christians second-class citizens. But was it as harsh as it seems to us today? Many argue that the Code of Omar was probably not written down until several centuries later, and that it wasn't always strictly enforced. There was never any compulsion to convert to Islam, and in the earliest period, the Muslims probably didn't want the Christians to convert because they needed their taxes. Although the Dhimma system has been abolished since the creation of nation states in the 20th century, it's probably just true to say that the idea of the system remains deeply embedded in the minds of both Muslims and Christians. Some Islamists in Egypt have said quite openly that if and when they gain power, they will force the Copts to pay the jizya. And in recent weeks, one Islamist group has actually done this in Raqqa in Syria. Five, how much have the numbers of Christians declined? To introduce this question, I want to commend a book which I regard as the most significant book on the history of Christian-Muslim relations that I've read in the last 10 years. It's called The, last His the Lost History of Christianity, The Thousand-Year Golden Age of the Church in the Middle East, Africa and Asia by Philip Jenkins, an American historian. Here are some of the basic statistics which he presents. In the sixth century, there were about 500 bishops in the churches in North Africa. But by the 8th century, there were hardly any. In 1050, Asia Minor had 373 bishoprics, and its population was almost entirely Christian. But by 1450, they were between 10 to 15% and had only three bishops. Crucial turning point came in the 14th century, which marks the decisive collapse of Christianity in the Middle East. 
between 1200 and 1500, the number of Christians in Asia declined from 21 million to 3.4 million. The 20th century saw a further significant decline in the numbers of Christians. In 1900, Christians were approximately 11% of the population of the whole region and 15 to 20% of Asia Minor. In 1915, Christians were 15% of Arab Palestinians and are now less than 1.5%. In 1970, Christians in Iraq were between 5 and 6 percent and are now reduced to less than 1 percent. I have to say that I was stunned when I first read this, this survey and when I was made aware of the numerical strength and spread of Christianity in this region in earlier centuries and of the dramatic fall in the proportion of Christians. Number six. To what extent is the decline related to Islam? This is one of the hardest questions of all, and there are two kinds of answers that are often given. On the one hand, many Christians conclude that it's largely because of Islam that Christians have suffered. On the other hand, many quote the verse, there is no compulsion in religion, and argue that Islam is essentially tolerant. I suspect that the truth probably lies somewhere between these two, ex two answers. Moderate Muslims interpret verses calling for fighting in the light of what they see as the peaceful message of the Quran as a whole. But many Islamists use them to justify fighting to force Jews and Christians to accept the rule of Islam. And Muslims can also argue that if Muslims today feel that they are in a situation similar to the ones in which the calls to warfare were revealed, they should be guided by those more warlike verses. It's also relevant to ask, how do Muslims think about the relationship between religion and state? Dean Modella. Most tend to believe that the kingdom of God needs to be embodied in social and political structures to enable the community to live in accordance with Sharia. Most Muslims in minority situations say that they are not seeking to establish an Islamic state. But it's hard to deny that a basic instinct in the minds of most Muslims is, in the words of Kenneth Cragg, Islam must rule. This was express, expressed by Sayyid Qutb in an extreme form in the words, la budda lil Islam an yahkum. Inevitably, Islam will rule. So, does the decline of Christianity have anything to do with Islam? I suggest the answer must be yes, but not in the simplistic way that many Christians would like us to believe. Seven. To what extent was the decline due to factors which had nothing to do with Islam? One of the strengths of Jenkins' book is that he suggests other reasons for the decline in the number of Christians which had nothing whatsoever to do with Islam. One, fallen human nature and the culture of the time. Both Christians and Muslims at different times in history engaged in appalling acts of cruelty Minority communities have often been made scapegoats at times of severe social disturbance. Two, geography and natural disasters. Christian communities in Mesopotamia were always vulnerable to invasion, while Egypt's Christians were protected by their geographical position in the Nile Valley. The Black Death was followed by a period of severe persecution. Three, weaknesses within Christian communities. The church in North Africa had largely foreign leadership and were not deeply rooted in the country. Some churches were too closely linked to one particular ethnic or linguistic group. Four, political reasons. Some of the Mongols, Mongol tribes were Christian and in the earlier period, Mongol leaders favored Christians more than Muslims, but gradually they began to favor Islam. 
and by 1300 many Mongols had converted to Islam. This led to the creation of what Jenkins calls a Muslim superstate, which was even more critical for the long-term relationship between Islam and Christianity than the original Arab conquests of the seventh century. This was the context in which Ibn Taymiyyah, who was regarded as the godfather of many Islamists today, set as his goal the militant restoration of Islam in the face of its enemies at home and abroad. Similar political factors largely account for the Armenian genocide and other developments in the 20th century. Jenkins writes, as so often in history, the persecutors saw their actions as fundamentally defensive in nature. And the sense that a majority community was facing grave threats to its very existence drove them to acts of persecution and intolerance against convenient minorities. The savagery of Muslim regimes must be understood as a manifestation of the shock and outrage they felt at the resistance of people they had come to view as natural inferiors. We cannot escape the fact, therefore, that Christians have suffered all of this at the hands of Muslims, but trying to understand all the different factors behind this suffering and decline should make us cautious about blaming everything on Islam. Eight, what has been the role of Islam in the Arab Spring? Many Christians have concluded that the Arab Spring has turned into an Islamic winter. Are their fears justified? The spontaneous explosion which occurred in Tunisia and spread quickly to Egypt and other countries was basically a protest against one-party police states, corruption, unemployment, economic hardship, and lack of freedom. Islam was not a significant factor in the start of the movement. In Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood waited for some days to see how events were going to unfold in Tahrir Square before they encouraged their members to join the demonstrations. Their networks enabled them very quickly to mobilize support for the revolution, to remove Mubarak from power, and to elect Mursi as president. For a brief year, Mursi attempted to impose an Islamist agenda, but was thwarted by popular protests and the power of the old regime. In June 2013, the army stepped in to remove Mursi and are now doing everything in their power to ensure that no Islamist party will ever be able to seize power in Egypt again. The army is firmly in control and Christians are generally very happy with the new constitution that has been passed. This does not mean, however, that political Islam is completely dead. In Tunisia, since the original protests removed Ben Ali, there, have been, there has been an intense struggle between the main Islamist party and secular groups. In recent weeks, these different parties seem to have reached a compromise which creates a balance between Islamist and secular agendas and which some see as a model which could be copied in other Arab countries. In Syria, the Muslim Brotherhood was for many decades the only real opposition to the Assad regime, but was brutally suppressed. The demonstrations which began in April 2011 were initially a protest against police brutality. But before long, many Sunnis joined out of bitterness against the minority Alawite regime which had kept Sunnis out of power for so long. After decades of authoritarian police states, many Muslims throughout the region genuinely want their governments to be more consciously Islamic. I believe that the majority do not want Islamist governments but equally, they do not want secular governments if being secular means that there is no place for Islamic values. When Muslims decide to take part in democratic processes, they are forced to balance their ideology with pragmatism. 
I suggest, therefore, that while the early promise of the Arab Spring has faded, it's premature to conclude that we have entered an Islamic winter. Nine, how are Muslims and Islam changing? These are three of the most significant developments and changes, in addition to all the momentous changes created by globalization and social media, that I see at the present time. One, there is a battle for the soul of Islam that continues to rage between jihadi Islamists, Islamists who reject violence, and other kinds of Muslims. This struggle is being played out most clearly in Syria. If foreign fighters were to withdraw and Syrian Muslims were left to themselves, they would certainly want Sunni Muslims, but not Islamists, to be in power. Two, if we have begun to understand what Islamism is all about, we now need to understand that there is such a thing as post-Islamism. Islamism refers to those ideologies and movements that strive to establish some kind of Islamic order, a religious state, Sharia law. Association with the state is a key feature of Islamist politics. Post-Islamism, on the other hand, wants to marry Islam with individual choice and freedom, with democracy and modernity. While it favors a civil and non-religious state, it accords an active role for religion in, public, in the public sphere. Three, tensions between Sunnis and Shiites have become more acute, and Sunnis are really fearful of the growth of the arc of Shiite power stretching westwards from Iran and including Bahrain, Iraq, Syria, and Hezbollah in Lebanon. So, some Muslims are changing through coming to terms with modernity, while others are changing because they have found that slogans like Islam is the solution, Al-Islam hu al hal don't put food on the table, build hospitals, and deal with corruption. So, could it be that Christians have a role to play as dialogue partners with Muslims. If so, we may not need to feel completely helpless as we watch Muslims responding to all that is happening. 10. How is the future of Christianity related to the politics of the, religion, the re region? I am painfully aware of the role that my country played after World War I in carving up the Middle East. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict is still near the heart of the problems of the whole region, and the emigration of Christians from Palestine has much more to do with political, social, and economic factors than with religion. To point out the role that the United States has played in the region, I want to commend the book Faith Misplaced, the Broken Promise of United States and Arab Relations, 1820 to 2001, by Osama Makdisi. It tells the story of how the work of Americans in the Middle East in the 19th century, especially missionaries, built up an enormous amount of goodwill. But this goodwill has largely been lost because of American policies in the region in the second half of the 20th century. The ethnic cleansing of Christians in, in Iraq has been directly related to the war of Iraq in 2003. The Christian minority has been identified in the eyes of Muslims with the so-called Christian West that is waging war on the Muslim East. Perhaps history is repeating itself. Just as Christians suffered because of their association with the Mongols, so Christians today are suffering because of their association with the West. This is the law of unintended consequences at work. The future of Christianity in the Middle East, therefore, doesn't depend only on Christians and Muslims in the region. It depends to a considerable extent on the foreign policies of the US, the EU, and Russia. Am I allowed to say that we should also be talking about Christ at the White House, at the Pentagon, on Capitol Hill, Christ at Westminster, and Christ in Brussels. Now, are any of these 10 questions the right questions? 
If they get us anywhere near an accurate analysis of the problem, we might say that the future of Christianity in this region depends on how well we respond in the following five areas. One, staying rooted in the region. This is the cruel dilemma facing many Christians. What is there to keep you here when you face such an uncertain future? What if you are Christian parents living in Bethlehem and you're concerned about how your children will get a good education and whether they will ever find work? If you have relatives abroad who are encouraging you to leave and if you already have a green card, what is there to encourage you to stay? When I raised this question at a seminar in Oxford four years ago, Munder responded by saying, what will keep us here is having a new sense of mission. In other words, if Christians can believe that they really do have something significant to contribute to their societies and their nation, they will want to stay. Two, being engaged with society. In the last 150 years, many Christian denominations have been engaged in educational and medical work. And a former Anglican bishop in Jerusalem once described schools and hospitals as the arms and legs of the church. But something more is required at the present time. Dare we say that Christians have to come out of their ghettos and find ways of being more engaged in their communities. In February 2011, just two weeks after the revolution started in Egypt, an American Presbyterian professor teaching in Egypt was preaching at an evangelical church in Cairo on Jeremiah's letter to the exiles in Babylon. After an incredibly enthusiastic response from the congregation, she wrote, I was amazed that the church here, whose pietistic and fearful isolationism has driven me crazy in the past, is now starting to engage in integrated reflection about public life and civic responsibility. Christian hope means a vision for society, for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. I have been deeply impressed with the work of the Holy Land Trust here in Bethlehem, which among other things, is doing all it can to build up civil society from the bottom up. Three, being aware of history and politics. Several Palestinian Christians have told me that they can trace their family history back several centuries. But how many are aware of the Christian doctors, engineers, artists and translators who played such a significant role under the Abbasid dynasty in Baghdad and made such an enormous contribution to Arab and Islamic civilization. Philip Jenkins writes, losing the ancient churches is one thing, but losing their memory and experiences so utterly is a disaster scarcely less damaging. To break the silence, we need to recover those memories to restore that history. This, of course, may not be easy for Protestant Christians who know more about the Reformation in Europe than the early church fathers, and who might think that real Christianity was brought to the region by Western missionaries in the 19th century. And history inevitably takes us into politics. It was living in Lebanon through the Civil War from 1975 that made me interested in both history and politics, so that in the last few years, I have read more books about history and politics than about theology. I realize that it's hard for many Christians to be interested in politics and even harder to engage in any kind of political activity. But some of us may need to see this as a special calling. And should we perhaps encourage some of our young people to study history, international relations and political science, dare I say, rather than theology? Four, learning new ways of relating to Muslims. Two years ago, when I was teaching a course on Islam in a master's program here at Bethlehem Bible College, one of the group summed up her feelings about her Muslim neighbors with the words, Nehna majruheen, we're wounded. A Lebanese Christian said to me some years ago, we fear them, and despise them at the same time. 
These words may not express the feelings of every Christian in the Middle East, and there are good historical reasons why many do feel in this way. But wherever there is hurt or fear or arrogance in our hearts, do we not need to ask the Holy Spirit to search our hearts and help us to work through our fears and prejudices? If Jesus was able to change the attitudes of his Jewish disciples towards Samaritans, can he not change our attitudes towards Muslims today? The prayer of the early church in Acts 4, and I'm so glad that Chris spoke about this this morning, can then become a model of how Christians should be praying today. Now, Lord, consider their threats, but instead of asking for protection, they pray, enable us, your servants, to speak your word with great boldness, and then go on to ask that God will act in his sovereign power to reach into the lives of their neighbors, while you stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders. It seems that God has been answering prayer of this kind because in recent years, increasing numbers of Muslims have become disciples of Jesus. This is a significantly new phenomenon and it may well be that Christianity in this region, region will look very different in 20 years' time. Five, understanding Muslims and Islam. When I was teaching a course on Quran, in Beirut, the daughter of a Syrian pastor admitted that although she had grown up with Muslims and knew something about their faith, she had never actually opened a Quran. In Cairo some years ago, I was surprised that no one in a group of Egyptian Christians had ever read the text of the Code of Omar. After a visit to Cairo in 1907, an American scholar of the Old Testament and Islam, D.B. MacDonald, wrote these words. I was profoundly conscious that the missionaries did not understand Muslims, were in fact, as far as Islam was concerned, horribly ignorant. Does horribly ignorant not describe the situation of many Christians today? I'm sure that for all of us, the answer to our question must be a resounding yes, but I would want to add, provided we are prepared, prepared to ask all the hard questions. I end with two passages of scripture. Jeremiah's letter to the exiles in Babylon includes the words, I know the plans I have for you, plans to give you hope and a future. A harit watikwa in the Hebrew. In the past, I have always read this as a promise addressed to me personally as an individual believer. But since it says you plural and not you singular, from now on I want to read it as a promise that is addressed to all the Christian communities in this region. Writing to Christians in Asia Minor to prepare them for difficult times ahead, Peter says, don't be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. He is careful to distinguish between suffering that we endure because of the name of Christ and suffering that we endure for other reasons. And he concludes, so then, those who suffer according to the will of God should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. So as we commit the future of Christianity in this region into the hands of God, let's commit ourselves to work for the total well-being of our societies. Well, I don't, I don't know about you, but I think this morning was amazing. And in the next 15 minutes, we will uh, we took some questions uh, from you. They are all good questions. So I'm going to ask our two speakers to come now and choose some of these questions uh, and answer them briefly. So we will have about five minutes of Q&A. And after that, we will head for lunch and get ready for our uh, field trips. Dr. Salim first. Um, I cannot answer all the questions, but I'll try to uh, answer some of them. <clears throat> I'll use a provocative one because I'm a provocative teacher. 
So I will start with where the most provocative question is. Here is it. Uh, where is that? Do you consider Israel as your Palestinian Christian enemy? No, no, I don't consider Israel as my enemy. Our people are in enmity. Our people don't like each other, hate each other. We need solution. So, uh, so how uh, do Palestinian Christian bless the Jewish people? I think in several areas we can bless them. Learn about them, about their history. Learn about their contribution to our faith. Witness to them about the Messiah of Israel. Seek reconciliation, unity, and work together for peace. This is the blessing. The future of the Jewish people in Israel depends on relationship to the Palestinian. The future of the Palestinian it depends on the relationship to the Jewish people. The Jewish people are not living in Scandinavia and the Palestinian not living in Malaysia. Next question. Is that provocative enough? <clears throat> yes, we are a small community. Somebody have a long, I will not, uh, for sake of time, I will not read all the question. Yes, we are a small community, but great things started with 12 people. Another question, how to overcome evil with good? What clothes that good look like? What should a Christian be doing? What about Palestinian Christians specifically? Uh, I think in uh, several areas, one of them, as I said, we need to examine our historical narrative, we need to examine our heart, if there is bitterness, if there is a wound, we need to be healed, and also to address anyone with, if somebody attack, was good. We need, in the Sermon of the Mount, there is a principle how we specifically can be engaged in the society according to the principle of God. Glenn Stassen in his book Just Peacemaking have outlined that very clearly. Sake of time, I'll not go with detail. Read the book. Reading book is good, by the way. Okay. <clears throat> what else? Oh, Colin, do you want to answer one? Meet them and go through them. Are you, you ready? Uh, why don't you ask someone else? Uh, regarding the interpretation of the Quran and Hadith, is your analysis of the interpretation regarding Islamic scholars, Imams, regular Muslims, or fanatics, or a combination of both? What were the sources for your analysis? Let me say that I would generally try and make a rule for myself. If I'm speaking to an audience of Christians, I want to imagine that there are Muslims present, so I want to be able to say things that Muslims will be happy with. And I would simply say that quite a lot of the stuff that I read is stuff written by Muslims. What I presented to you is how Muslim scholars in, uh, understand the rules of hermeneutics of, of, of the Quran. So I'm not doing something from the outside, I'm trying to listen to what they do and how they interpret their scriptural sources. Am I allowed another one? Yes. Although in Egypt the Muslim Brotherhood was more outspoken about Islamic roots, were not the initiators of the revolution also Muslim? Thus, is not secular Islam an equally relevant and powerful face of Islam? What I was trying to say was, that the causes of the Arab Spring of the Revolution were not to basically to do with Islam and religion. As I said, police states, the secret police, lack of freedom, unemployment, and, and, and. These are the things that have made people angry. There's a wonderful novel written by an Egyptian dentist called the Yakubian building. If you want to get a feeling for what people were rebelling against in Egypt, read that novel, it's fantastic. Yes, these people were Muslims, but it was not Islamic belief and dogma that was motivating them to get out into Maidan Tahrir. It was several days after the revolution started that the Muslim Brotherhood decided that this was going to be successful enough and wanted to join in and add their voices to the protest. 
So secular Muslim, Muslim, what do we mean by secular Islam? I, I talked about post-Islamism. Uh, Muslims are trying to live in the real world, and they're obviously being influenced by all the things that are happening. But I'm very uneasy with this description of secular Muslims. Okay, one of the questions here, do you argue that in an emerging Christian narratives that can heal the land, are you aware of any new Jewish or Muslim narrative emerging that brings hopes? <clears throat> I'm not talking about Christian narratives, I'm talking about the kingdom of God. Uh, because any theology is human endeavor with human limitation. So my, any narrative has its own limitation. We need to allow God to be God and pursue and act according to the principle of the, of the Sermon of the Mount uh, that our Lord has taught us. Uh, sadly to say, the majority, the majority of the narrative that there is among Muslims and Jews are concerning uh, that this area is very exclusive. And that is a problematic uh, uh, issue for me that as far as I know, maybe we are also very minority voice in that uh, case. So I'm not aware very much on emerging. Matter of fact, uh, most of the emerging narrative I hear, it's from outside the Middle East. In Europe, Jewish historian and Muslim historian in Europe and the state are, are beginning to, to speak different language. How do you interpret the prophecy in Isaiah 19 about the future for Egypt, Assyria, and Israel? Is this a vision or dream for the future? Blessed be Egypt, my people, um, and Assyria, the work of my hand, and so on. Um, in 1959, the, there was a united Arab Republic, Egypt, joining together with Syria in the United Republic. It only lasted about two years, and it, it, it was a disaster. Many Christians at the time thought, ah, this is the fulfillment of Isaiah 19. I suggest to you, my understanding is that this is a prophecy that was fulfilled in the first centuries of the Christian era, when there were thriving Christian communities in Egypt, Syria, Palestine, and Mesopotamia. And therefore, I, and, and also, blessed be Egypt, my people, you, 1 Peter, Peter says, you are the chosen people. He takes titles that are reserved only for the chosen people, the children of Israel in the Old Testament, and applies them to every believer in the Messiah. Um, our, God's, God's handiwork from Isaiah 19 as well. Isn't that a phrase that's also taken up in the New Testament? The church is God's handiwork. And remember in the original context, Egypt was a foreign power that had oppressed the children of Israel. They were pagans. These were horrible people living in Egypt. And the prophet says, bless, he, he takes a title, my people, applied only to the Jewish people, to the children of Israel, and applies it to these foreign pagans in Egypt. I would say this is fulfilled in the kingdom of God where Egyptians, Syrians, and everybody are, are included um, in the body of Christ. In your opinion, what is the future of mixed marriages between Muslims and Christians in this country of Palestine? I think I would say that as somebody coming from outside, I wouldn't dare to answer something as specific as this. <laughs> Okay, maybe the last question or two questions. How, uh, well, one of my favorite ladies asked the question. A uh, question? Uh, the answer to that question? Okay, you want an hour. You said our theology and conduct should be a blessing to our enemy. Who is our enemy? Any person we're in conflict with can be in your church, in your home, in your family, in any person that your relationship is uh, in form of destructive relationship. So our enemy, any person that we are not uh, a source of blessing, we're in conflict with. 
Uh, how would you like to change the way Middle Eastern history is studied and in the US and other Western countries? I think the failure of the left, if may I be critical now from, for the failure of the, rest, the left, they are quite a bit uh, in bondage of post-colonial era. I would like to see the left that in very domination, or the liberal, very dominating uh, Western university, European university especially, is not to see Christianity as Western religion. Christianity is Middle Eastern religion, is part of the Middle East, is not being brought here by Britain and America. That's really the key thing. It is Middle Eastern faith, grew up in this land. So Western historian, please change if you listen. Second, address issues of right of minor minority. As much I challenge uh, Western countries and attitude toward Muslim people, also we need to challenge the Muslim world, we need to challenge Arab countries, we need to challenge Palestinian Authority, we need to challenge Israel in its treatment on religious right and especially the right of women too. Uh, those issues have not been addressed quite a bit uh, in our uh, uh, academia. We, some academia have accepted this is the way the East go and this is the way the West go. No, those principles of freedom of expression, freedom of faith, human right, are biblical principles that apply to everyone everywhere around the world. I can run for election now. Do you think that the, the Christian Palestinians failed to engage into Muslim society? When I was teaching this course at Bethlehem Bible College at two and a half years ago, I wanted to take the whole class to have tea with the Imam at the mosque, which is just two minutes walk from the college. Am I allowed to say that some of the students were very, very reluctant to do so and needed quite a lot of persuasion? In the end, I'm glad to say that all of them came and we had a very pleasant hour in the salon of the Imam beside the mosque, drinking his lemon and having discussion with him. Um, I, I simply want to say, I understand the legacy of 1,400 years of difficult relationships living as dhimmis under Islam. I understand that. But I also think that we Christians in this part of the world have got to reach out to Muslims as human beings, as friends, as neighbors, and find new ways of relating to them. Colin, as a teacher of the Bible College, can I add something? Okay, I, I do agree with you and fully embrace what you're saying. But also, uh, for the, uh, what our students are struggling with is the change of cultures. And, and, and that's what we see in both uh, when a Jewish person and Muslim people become more religious his conduct with the other or her conduct with the other change, a dressing code, food, uh, uh, you know, regulation, uh, interaction with others that are not member of their gender, of their faith, too. So uh, what I have found out in my research, other than religion, the culture factors plays a very, very, in fact, in some cases, more important role than religious factors. We attribute it into religious factor, but in matter of fact, when you ask deeper question, you discover that it's a culture factor that also a result of a change of belief, uh, religious beliefs and, and expression. So that is very important uh, aspect. I have another question. You okay? Do you want to answer? Okay. I have a question here. Um, to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, what is e which is easier? Tell me, what's your question? 
convert Israeli to Christianity, convert Palestinian to Christianity, why and why not? Okay, I mean, every question is important question. Uh, let me, let me uh, say it like this, an answer. Wherever we are, the way I understand the gospel of the kingdom of God, we're calling people at the same time to reconcile to God and to each other. I personally, if you allow me, follow uh, uh, Roman chapter 12. Each one of us has to go through the process of renewal of the mind, the love of the brethren, and the unity among us that is a testimony for his peace, is his declaration of his peace, and try to live with peace with, uh, ev with everyone else. Um, when we say the word convert, I, I, to be honest with you, um, to convert to uh, Anglican Christianity, uh, are you, you will be happy with that? No. Um, or uh, anyone else, because my wife is Anglican, so I take that as an advantage, you know, to say that. I, I think we need to call anyone to be disciples of Jesus in their culture, context, and their ethnic identity. Who they are, what they are, they need to be, uh, they need to be, they need to hear, and they need to transform by the work of Jesus in their culture and ethnic context. It's not for me to decide for them fully how it is to be. So I'm not so much comfortable with that word to convert. But I'm very, very much comfortable that we need to call the kingdom the peace that there is in the kingdom of God for everyone. And that, brothers and sisters, the problem is sometimes it is in us. Before we change others, we need to be changed. And this is what the purpose of this conference. Let us first clean our house. Let us live in peace with each other. Let us have unity among ourselves. Let us listen to each other. Let us express mercy and compassion to each other in spite of the fact that we have very differences, differences theological, political uh, uh, understanding. Let's give them one more round of applause. Thank you and we really uh, appreciate it.